It is the imaginative quality of Christ's own nature that makes him this palpitating center of romance. The strange figures of the poetic drama and ballad are made by the imagination of others. But out of his own imagination entirely did Jesus of Nazareth create himself. The cry of Isaiah had really no more to do with his coming than the song of the nightingale has to do with the rising of the moon. No more, though perhaps no less, he was the denial as well as the affirmation of prophecy. For every expectation that he fulfilled, there was another that he destroyed. In all beauty, says Francis Bacon, there is some strangeness of proportion, and of those who are born of the spirit, of those, that is to say, who like himself are dynamic forces, Christ says that they are like the wind that bloweth where it listeth, and no man can tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. That is why he is so fascinating to artists. He has all the color elements of life, mystery, strangeness, pathos, suggestion, ecstasy, love. He appeals to the temper of wonder and creates that mood in which alone he can be understood. And to me, it is a joy to remember that if he is of imagination all compact, the world itself is of the same substance. I said in Dorian Gray that the great sins of the world take place in the brain, but it is in the brain that everything takes place. We know now that we do not see with the eyes or hear with the ears. There are really channels for the transmission adequate or inadequate of sense impressions. It is in the brain that the poppy is red, that the apple is odorous, that the skylark sings. Of late, I have been studying with diligence the four prose poems about Christ. At Christmas, I managed to get hold of a Greek testament, and every morning, after I have cleaned my cell and polished my tins, I read a little of the Gospels, a dozen verses taken by chance anywhere. It is a delightful way of opening the day. Every one, even in a turbulent, ill-disciplined ill life, should do the same. Endless repetition in and out of season has spoiled us from the freshness, the the naivety, the simple romantic charm of the Gospels. We hear them read far too often and far too badly, and all repetition is anti-spiritual. When one returns to the Greek, it is like going into a garden of lilies out of some narrow and dark house. And to me, the pleasure is doubled by the reflection that it is extremely probable that we have actual terms the ipsissima verba used by Christ. It was always supposed that Christ talked in Aramaic. Even Renan thought so. But now we know that the Galilean peasants, like the Irish peasants of our own day, were bilingual and that Greek was the ordinary language of intercourse all over Palestine, as indeed all over the Eastern world. I never liked the idea that we knew Christ's own words only through a translation of a translation. It is a delight to me to think that as far as his conversation was concerned, Charmides might have listened to him, and Socrates reasoned with him, and Plato understood him that he really said, I am the good shepherd. that when he thought of the lilies of the field and how they neither toil nor spin, his absolute expression was Plant the lilies of the field so that the child grows and does not fade. And that his last word, when he cried out, my life has been completed, has reached its fulfillment 
has been perfected was exactly as St. John tells us as it was. Teteleste. It is done. No more. While in reading the Gospels, particularly to that of St. John himself or whatever early Gnostic took his name and mantle, I see the continual assertion of the imagination as the basis of all spiritual and material life. I see also to that Christ imagination was simply a form of love, and to that him love was Lord in the fullest meaning of the phrase. Some six weeks ago, I was allowed by the doctor to have white bread to eat instead of the coarse black or brown bread of ordinary prison fare. It is a great delicacy. It will, stay, it will sound strange that dry bread could possibly be a delicacy to anyone. To me, it is so much so that at the close of each meal, I carefully eat whatever crumbs may be left on my tin plate or have fallen on the rough towel that one uses as a cloth, so as not to soil one's table. And I do so not for hunger. I get now quite sufficient food, but simply in order that nothing should be wasted of what is given to me, so one should look on love. Christ, like all fascinating personalities, had the power of not merely saying beautiful things himself, but of making other people say beautiful things to him. And I love the story of St. Mark telling us about the Greek woman who, when as a trial of her faith, he said to her that he could not give her the bread of the children of Israel, answered him that the little dogs, well, little dogs as in, Kinaria. Little dogs, it should be rendered, who are under the table, eat of the crumbs that the children let fall. Most people live for love and admiration, but it was by love and admiration that we should live. If any love is shown us, we should recognize that we're quite unworthy of it. Nobody's worthy to be loved. The fact that God loved man shows us that in the divine order of ideal, it is written that eternal love is to be given to what is eternally unworthy. Or if that phrase seems to be bitter and so sad to bear, let us say that everyone is worthy of love except him who thinks that he is. Love is a sacrament that should be taken kneeling and domine, nom sum dignus, should be on the lips and in the hearts of those who receive it. If I ever write again in the sense of producing artistic work, there are just two subjects on which through and through, which I desire to express myself. One is Christ as the precursor of the romantic movement in life, and the other is the artistic life considered in its relation to conduct. The first, of course, is intensely fascinating, for I see in Christ not merely the essentials of the supreme romantic type, but all the accidents, the willfulness even, of the romantic temperament also. He was the first person to ever said to people that they should live flower-like lives. He fixed the phrase. He took children as the type of what people should try to become. He held them up as examples to their elders which I myself have always thought the chief use of each one should be a guisa di fanciulla che pe... sorry a guisa di fanciulla che pa... piacendo e ridendo pagoleccia or rather let me translate that for you Like a girl who weeps and laughs as a child. He felt that life was changeful, fluid, active, and to that to allow it to be stereotyped in any form was death. He saw that people should not be too serious over material common interests, that to be unpractical was to be a great thing. 
that one should not bother too much over affairs. The birds didn't, so why should man? He is charming when he says, take no thought for the morrow. Is not the soul more than meat? Is the body more than raiment? A Greek might have used the latter phrase. It is full of Greek feeling, but only Christ could have said both and so summed up life perfectly for us. His morality is all sympathy, just what morality should be. If the only thing that he ever had said had been her sins are forgiven her because she loved much, it would have been worthwhile dying to have said it. His justice is all poetical justice, exactly what justice should be. The beggar goes to heaven because he has been unhappy. I cannot conceive a better reason for his being sent there. The people who work for an hour in the vineyard in the cool of the evening receive just as much reward as those who have toiled there all day long in the hot sun. Why shouldn't they? Probably no one deserved anything. Or perhaps there was a different kind of people. Christ had no patience with the dull, lifeless, mechanical systems that treat people as if they were things and so treat everybody alike. For him, there were no laws. There were no exceptions. There were exceptions merely, as if anybody or anything for that matter was like aught else in the world. That which is the very keynote of romantic art was to him the proper basis of natural life. He saw no other basis, and when they brought him one, taken in the very act of sin and showed him her sentence written in the law and asked him what was to be done he wrote with his finger on the ground as though he had did not hear them and finally when they pressed him again looked up and said let him of you who has never sinned be the first to throw the stone at her it was worthwhile living to have said that like all poetical natures, he loved ignorant people. He knew that in the soul of one who was ignorant, there is always room for a great idea. But he could not stand stupid people, especially those who were made stupid by education. People who are full of opinions, not one of which they even understand. A peculiarly modern type. Summed up by Christ when he describes it as the type of one who has the key of knowledge, cannot use it himself, and does not allow people to use it. Though it may be made to open the gate of God's kingdom, his chief war was against the Philistines. That is the war every child of light has to wage. Philistinism was the note of the age and community in which he lived in their heavy inaccessibility to ideas, their dull respectability, their tedious orthodoxy, their worship of vulgar success. Your entire preoccupation with the gross materialistic side of life and their ridiculous estimate of themselves and their importance. The people of Jerusalem in Christ's day were the exact counterpart of the British Philistine of our own. Christ mocked at the whited sepulchre of respectability and fixed that phrase forever. He treated worldly success as a thing absolutely to be despised. He saw nothing in it at all. He looked on wealth as an encumbrance to a man. He will not hear of life being sacrificed to any system of thought of morals. He pointed out that forms and ceremonies were made for man, not man for forms and ceremonies. He took Sabbatarianism as a type of relentless scorn. To us, what is termed orthodoxy is merely a facile, unintelligent acquiescence to him. And in their hands, it was a terrible and paralyzing tyranny. Christ swept it aside. He showed that the spirit alone was of value. He took a keen pleasure in pointing out to them that though they were always reading the law and the prophets, they had not really the smallest idea of what either of them meant. In opposition to their tithing each separate day into the fixed routine of prescribed duties as they tithe mint and rue, he preached the enormous importance of living completely for the moment. Those whom he has saved from their sins are saved simply for beautiful moments in their lives. Mary Magdalene, when she sees Christ, 
breaks the rich vase of alabaster that one of her seven lovers have given her and spills the odorous spices over his tired, dusty feet. And for that one moment's sake, sits forever with Ruth and Beatrice in the tresses of the snow-white rose of paradise. All that Christ says to us by the way of a little warning is that every moment should be beautiful, that the soul should always be ready for the coming of the bridegroom, always waiting for the voice of the lover. Philistinism being simply that of men's nature that's not illumined by the imagination. He sees all the lovely influences of life as modes of life. <laughs> modes of light. The imagination itself is the world of light. The world is made by it, and yet the world cannot understand it. And that is because the imagination is simply a manifestation of love. And it is love and the capacity for it that distinguish one that distinguishes one human being from another. But it is when he deals with a sinner that Christ is most romantic in the sense of most real. The world had always loved the saints as being the nearest possible approach to the perfection of God. Christ, through some divine instinct in him, seems to have always loved the sinner as being the nearest possible approach to the perfection of man. His primary desire was not to reform people any more than his primary desire was to relieve suffering. To turn an interesting thief into a tedious, honest man was not his aim. He would have thought little, sorry, he would have thought little of the Prisoner's Aid Society and the modern movements of the kind. The conversion of a publican into a Pharisee would not have seemed to him a great achievement, but in a manner not yet understood of the world, he regarded sin and suffering as being in themselves beautiful, holy things and modes of perfection. It seems a very dangerous idea. It is. All great ideas are dangerous. That was Christ's creed admits of no doubt that it is the true creed I don't doubt myself. Of course, the sinner must repent, but why? Simply because otherwise he would be unable to realize what he had done. The moment of repentance is the moment of initiation. More than that, it is the means by which one alters one's past. The Greeks thought the impossible. They often say in their gnomic aphorisms, even the gods cannot alter the past. Christ showed that the commonest sinner could do it. That it was the one thing he could do. Christ, had he been asked, would have said, I feel quite certain about this, that the moment of the prodigal son fell on his knees and wept, he made his having wasted his substance with harlots, his swine herding and hungering for the husks they ate, beautiful and holy moments in his life. It is difficult for most people to grasp the idea. I dare say one has to go to prison to understand it. If so, it may be worthwhile going to prison. There is something so unique about Christ. Of one... To, sorry. Of course, just as there are fall dawns before the dawn itself, and winter days so full of sudden sunlight that they will cheat the wise crocus into squandering its gold before its time and make some foolish bird call to its mate to build on barren bows. So there were Christians before Christ. For what we should be grateful. The unfortunate thing is that there have been none since. I make one exception, St. Francis of Assisi, but then God had given him at birth the soul of a poet, as he himself, when quite young, had in mystical marriage taken poverty as his bride. And with the soul of a poet and the body of a beggar, he found the way to an imperfection not... Sorry. And with the soul of a poet and the body of a beggar, he found the way to perfection not difficult. He understood Christ, and so people became like him. We do not require the labor confirmatum to teach us that the life of St. Francis was a true imitatio Christi, a poem compared to which the book of that name is merely prose. Indeed, that is the charm about Christ.
Sorry, I just realized my captions have been saying Christ this entire time. That's really funny. But simultaneously, let me also remove that. <laughs> I did not realize something so humorous as such as that. So I apologize on that front. You could at least hear my words and hear my recitation upon this letter that Oscar Wilde has been reading. Or writing, rather. It's quite beautiful, so let me continue, okay? Indeed, that is the charm about Christ. Is that better? Christ. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it's still happening. Let me find that once again. And so I can save it. Christ. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I do apologize. Let me blow my nose really quick because this has been making me cry actually. Indeed, that is the charm about Christ. When all is said, he is just like a work of art. He does not really teach one anything, but by being brought into his presence, one becomes something and everybody is predestined to his presence. Once at least in his life, each man walks with Christ to a mouse. As regards the other subject, the relation of artistic life to conduct, it will no doubt seem strange to you that I should select it. People point to reading jail and say, That is where the artistic life leads a man. Well, it might lead to worse places. The more mechanical people to whom life is a shrewd speculation, depending on careful calculation of ways and means, always know where they're going and go there. They start with the ideal desire of being the parish beetle. And... In whatever sphere they are placed, they succeed in being the parish beetle and no more. A man whose desire is to be something separate from himself, to be a member of parliament or a successful grocer or a prominent solicitor or a judge or something equally tedious invariably succeeds in being what he wants to be. That is his punishment. Those who want a mask have to wear it. But with the dynamic, sorry. <laughs> but with the dynamic forces of life, and those in whom those dynamic forces become incarnate, it is different. People whose desire is solely for self-realization never know where they're going. They can't know. In one sense of the word, it is of course necessary, as the Greek oracle once said, to know oneself. That is the first achievement of knowledge. But to recognize that the soul of man is unknowable is the ultimate achievement of wisdom. The final mystery is oneself. When one has weighed the sun in the balance and measured the steps of the moon and mapped out the seven heavens star by star, there still remains oneself. Who can calculate the orbit of his own soul? When the son went out to look for his father's asses, he did not know that a man of God was waiting for him with the very chrism of coronation, and that his own soul was already the soul of a king. I hope to live long enough and to produce work of such a character that I shall be able at the end of my days to say, yes, this is just where the artistic life leads a man. Two of the most perfect lives I have come across in my own experience are the lives of Verlaine and of Prince Kropotkin, both of them men who have passed years in prison, the first the one Christian poet since Dante, the other a man with a soul of that beautiful Christ in which seems coming out of Russia. And for the last seven or eight months, in spite of succession of great troubles reaching me, from the outside world, almost without intermission, I've been placed in direct contact with a new spirit working in this prison through man and things that has helped me beyond any possibility in my expression of words. 
So that while the first year of my imprisonment I did nothing else and can remember doing nothing else but wring my hands in impotent despair and say what an ending, <laughs> what an appalling ending now I try to say to myself. And sometimes when I'm not torturing myself to really and sincerely say what a beginning, what a wonderful beginning. It may really be so. It may become so. If it does, I shall owe much to this new personality that has altered every man's life in this place. You may realize it when I say that I have been released last May as I tried to be. I would have left this place loathing it and every official in it with a bitterness of hatred that could have been poisoned in my life. I've had a year longer of imprisonment. But humanity has been the prison along with us all. Sorry, but humanity had been in the prison along with us all. And now when I go out, I shall always remember great kindness that I have received here from almost everybody. And on the day of my release, I shall give many things to many people and ask to be remembered by them in turn. The prison style is absolutely and entirely wrong. I would give anything to be able to alter it when I go out. I intend to try, but there is nothing in the world so wrong but that the spirit of humanity, which is the spirit of love, the spirit of the Christ, who in, who's not in churches may make it, if not right, at least possible to be born without too much bitterness of heart. I know also that much is waiting for me outside that is very delightful from what St. Francis of Assisi calls my brother the wind and my sister the rain lovely things both of them down to the shop windows and sunsets of great cities if I made a list of all that still remains to me I don't know where I should stop for indeed God made the world just as much for me as anyone else perhaps I may go out with something that I have not gone before I need not tell you to me that reformations and morals are as meaningless and vulgar as reformations the in theology. But why would to propose to be a better man is a piece of unscientific cant. To have become a deeper man is the privilege of those who have suffered, and such I think I have become. If after I am free, a friend of mine gave a feast and did not invite me to it, I should not mind it a bit. I can be perfectly happy by myself, with freedom, flowers, books, and the moon. Who cannot be perfectly happy? Besides, feasts are not for me anymore. I've given too many care about. I've given too many to care about them. Oh, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> that side of life is over for me. Very fortunately, I dare say. But if after I could not be, or sorry, <laughs> but if after I am free, a friend of mine had a sorrow and refused to allow me to share it, I should feel it most bitterly if he shut the doors of the house of mourning against me. I would come back again and again to be beg and beg to be admitted, sorry, so that I may share in what I was entitled to share in. If he thought me unworthy, unfit to weep with him, I should feel it as the most poignant humiliation, as the most terrible mode in which disgrace could be inflicted upon me. But that could not be. I have a right to share in sorrow, and he who, and he who can look at the loveliness of the world and share its sorrow and realize something of the wonder of both, it is in immediate contact with divine things and as God is nearer to God's secret as anyone can get <sighs> perhaps they may come into my art also no less than into my life a still deeper note of one's greater unity of passion and directness of impulse not with but intensity is the true aim of modern art we're no longer in art concerned with the type. It is with the exception that we have to do. I cannot put my sufferings into any form they took, I need hardly say. Art only begins where imitation ends. 
but something must come into my work, a fuller memory of words perhaps, of richer cadences, of more curious effects, of simpler architectural order, of some aesthetic quality at any rate. When Marcius was born, torn from the scabbard of his limbs, de la... <laughs> sorry. Wow. De la vagina de la membre sue, to use one of Dante's most terrible Tacitian phrases. He had no more song, the Greek said. Apollo had been victor. The lyre had vanquished the reed. But perhaps the Greeks were mistaken. I hear in modern art the cry of Marcius. It is bitter in Baudelaire, sweet and plaintive in Lamartine, mystic in Verlaine. It is the deferred resolutions of Chopin's music. It is the discontent that haunts Burne Jones's women. Even Matthew Arnold, whose songs of catacles, tales of the triumph of the sweet, persuasive liar, and the famous final victory in which, in such a clear note of lyrical beauty, has not a little of it, in the troubled undertone of doubt and distress that haunts his verses near the Gothi, nor Wordsworth could help him, though he followed each in turn in which he seeks to mourn for thesis or to sing of a scholar. It is the reed he has to take for the rendering of his strain. But whether or not the Phrygian fawn was silent, I cannot be. Expression is as necessary to me as leaf and blossoms are to the black branches of the trees that show themselves above the prison walls and are so restless in the wind. Between my art and the world, there is now a wide gulf, but between art and myself, there is none. I hope at least that there is none. To each of us, different fates are meted out. My lot has been one of public infamy, of long imprisonment, of misery, of ruin, of disgrace. But I'm not worthy of it, not yet at any rate. I remember that I used to say that I thought I could bear a real tragedy if it came to me with purple pall and a mask of noble sorrow. But that the dreadful thing about modernity was that if put tragedy into the raiment of comedy so that the great realities seemed commonplace or grotesque and lacking in style. It is true, quite true about modernity. It has probably always been true about actual life. It said that all martyrdom seemed to mean cruel to the looker on. The 19th century is no exception to the rule. Everything about my tragedy has been hideous, mean, repellent, lacking in style. Our very dress makes us grotesque. We are the zanies of sorrow. We are clowns whose hearts are broken. We are especially designed to appeal to the sense of humor. On November 13th, 1895, I was brought down here from London from two o'clock till half past two on that day. I had to stand on the center platform of Clapham Junction in convict dress and handcuffed for the world to look at. I'd been taken out of the hospital ward without a moment's notice being given to me. Of all possible objects, I was the most grotesque. When people saw me, they laughed. Each train as it came up welled. Laughter in the audience. Nothing could exceed their amusement. That was, of course, before they knew who I was. As soon as they had been informed, they laughed still more. For half an hour, I stood there in the gray November rain, surrounded by a jeering mob. For a year after, that was done to me. I wept every day at the same hour and for the same space of time. That is not such a tragic thing as possibly it sounds to you. To those who are in prison, tears are a part of every day's experience. A day in prison on which one does not weep is a day on which one's heart is hard, not a day on which one's heart is happy. Well, now I am really beginning to feel more regret for the people who have laughed than for myself. Of course, when they saw me, I was not on my pedestal. I was in the pillory. But 
It is a very unimaginative nature that only cares for people on their pedestals. A pedestal may be a very unreal thing. A pillory is a terrific reality. They should have known also how to interpret sorrow better. I have said that behind sorrow there is always sorrow. It were wiser still to say that behind sorrow there is always a soul, and to mock at a soul in pain is a dreadful thing. In the strangely simple economy of the world, people only get what they give, and to those who have not enough imagination to penetrate the mere outward of things and feel pity, what pity can be given save that of scorn? I write this account of the mode of my being transferred here simply that it should be realized. How hard it has been for me to get anything out of my punishment but bitterness and despair. I have, however, to do it. And now and then I have moments of submission and acceptance. All the spring may be hidden in the single bud, and the low ground nest of the lark may hold the joy that is to herald the feet of many rose-red dawns. So perhaps whatever beauty of life still remains to me is contained in some moment of surrender, abasement, and humiliation. I can, at any rate, merely proceed on the lines of my own development and, accepting all that has happened to me, make myself worthy of it. People used to say of me that I was too individualistic. I must be far more of an individualist than I ever was. I must get far more out of myself than I ever got and ask far less of the world than I ever asked. Indeed, my ruin came not from far too great individual. Sorry. Indeed, my ruin came not too. Indeed, my ruin came not from too great individualism of life, but from too little. The one disgraceful, unpardonable. Sorry, my tongue is being tied right now. I do have dyslexia, so please forgive me. The one disgraceful, unpardonable, and to all time contemptible action of my life was to allow myself to appeal to society for help and protection. To have made such an appeal would have been from the individualist point of view bad enough, but what excuse can there ever be to put forward for having made it? Of course, once I had put into motion the forces of society, society turned on me and said, Have you been living all this time in defiance of my laws? And do you now appeal to those laws for protection? You shall have those laws exercised to the full. You shall abide by what you have appealed to. And the result is I am in jail. Certainly so man ever fell so ignobly and by such ignoble instruments as I did. The Philistine element in life is not the pleasure, sorry. The Philistine element in life is not the failure to understand art. Charming people such as fishermen, shepherds, plo, sorry. <laughs> this is worded weird. Charming people such as fishermen, shepherds, plowboys, peasants and the like know nothing about art and are the very salt of the earth. He is the Philistine who upholds and aids the heavy, cumbrous, blind, mechanical forces of society, and who does not recognize dynamic force where he meets it, either in a man or a movement. People thought it dreadful of me to have entertained at dinner the evil things of life, and to have found pleasure in their company, but then from the point of view through which I, as an artist in life, approach them, they were delightfully suggestive and stimulating. The danger was half the excitement. My business as an artist was with Ariel. I set myself to wrestle with Caliban. A great friend of mine, a friend of ten years of standing, came to see me some time ago and told me that he did not believe a single word of what was said against me and wished me to know that he considered me quite innocent and the victim of a hideous plot. I burst into tears at what he said and told him that while there was much amongst the definite charges that was quite untrue and transferred to me by revolting malice, still that my life had been full of perverse pleasures, and that unless he accepted that as fact about me, 
and realized it to the full. I could not possibly be friends with him anymore, or ever be in his company. It was a terrible shock to him, but we are friends. And I've not got his friendship on false pretenses. Emotional forces, as I say somewhere in intentions, are as limited in extent and duration as the forces of physical energy. The little cup that is made to hold so much can hold so much and no more through all the purple bats of burgundy be filled with wine to the brim and the treaders stand knee deep in the gathered grapes of the stony vineyards of Spain. There is no error more common than that of thinking that those who are the causes of occasions of great tragedies share in the feeling suitable to the tragic mood no more fatal than expecting it of them. The martyr in his shirt of flame. may be looking on the face of God. But to him who is piling the sticks or loosening the logs for the blast, the whole scene is no more than the slaying of an ox is to the butcher, or the felling of a tree whose charcoal burner in the forest, or the fall of a flower to the one who is mowing down the grass with a scythe. Great passions are for the great of soul, and great events can be seen only by those who are on a level of them. I know nothing in all drama more incomparable from the point of view of art, nothing more suggestive in its subtlety of observation than Shakespeare's drawing of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They are Hamlet's college friends. They have been his companions. They bring with him memories of pleasant days together. At the moment when they come across him in the play, he is staggering under the weight of a burden intolerable to one of his temperament. The dead have come armed out of the grave to impose on him a mission at once too great and too mean for him. He is a dreamer and he is called upon to act. He has the nature of the poet, and he is asked to grapple with the common complexity of cause and effect, with life in its practical realization, of which he knows nothing, not with life in its ideal essence, of which he knows so much. He has no conception of what to do, and in his folly is to feign folly. Brutus used madness as a cloak to conceal the sword of his purpose, the dagger of his will, but when Hamlet but with Hamlet, madness is a mere mask for the hiding of weakness. In the making of fancies and jests, he sees a chance of delay. He keeps playing with action as an artist plays with theory. He makes himself the spy of proper actions and listening to his own words, knows them to be but words and words and words. Instead of trying to be the hero of his own history, he seeks to be the spectator of his own tragedy. He disbelieves in everything, including himself, and yet his doubt helps him not, as it comes not from skepticism, but from a divided will. Of all this, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz realize nothing. They bow and mark and smile. Sorry, they bow and smirk and smile. And what the one says, the other echoes with sickliest intonation. When at last, by means of the play within the play, the puppets in their dalliance, Hamlet catches the conscience of the king and drives the wretched man in terror from his throne. Guildenkrantz and Rosenstern. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guildenstern and Rosenkrantz. Well, they see no more in his context. They see no more in his conduct than a rather painful breach of court etiquette. <sighs> that is as far as they can attain in the contemplation of the spectacle of life with appropriate emotions. They are close to his very secret and know nothing of it, nor would there be any use in telling them. 
they are the little cups that can hold so much and no more. Towards the close, it is suggested that caught in a cunning spree set for another. A cunning spring, rather. They have met or may meet with a violent and sudden death, but a tragic ending of this kind, though touched by Hamlet's humor with something of the surprise and justice of comedy, is really not for such as they. They never die. Horatio, who, in order to report Hamlet and his cause a right to the unsatisfied, absents him from Felicity a while, and in this harsh world draws his breath in pain. Dies, but Guildenstern and Rosencrantz are as immortal as Angelo and Tartuffe, and should rank with them. They are what modern life has contributed to the antique ideal of friendship. He who writes a new De Amicitia must find a niche for them and praise them in Tusculan prose. They are types fixed for all time. To censure them would show a lack of appreciation. They are merely out of their sphere. That is all. In sublimity of soul, there is no contagion. High thoughts and high emotions are by their very existence isolated. I am to be released if all goes well with me toward the end of May, and hope to go at once to some little seaside village abroad with my lovers. The sea as Euripides says in one of his plays about Iphigenia, washes away the stains and wounds of the world. I hope to be at least a month with my friends and to gain peace and balance and less troubled heart and a sweeter mood. I have a strange longing for the great and simple primeval things such as the sea to me, no less a mother than the earth. It seems to me that we all look at nature too much and live with her too little. I discern great sanity in the Greek attitude. They never chattered about sunsets or discussed whether the shadows on the grass were really mauve or not. But they saw that the sea was for the swimmer and the sand for the feet of the runner. They loved the trees for the shadow that they cast, and the forest for its silence at noon. The vineyard dresser wreathed his hair with ivy that he might keep off the rays of the sun as he stooped over the young shoots. And for the artist and the athlete, the two types that Greece gave us, they plated with garlands the leaves of the bitter laurel and of the wild parsley, which else had been of no service to men. We call ours a utilitarian age, and we do not know the uses of any single thing. We have forgotten that water can cleanse and fire purify, and that the earth is mother to us all. As a consequence, our art is of the moon and plays with shadows, while Greek art is of the sun and deals directly with things. I feel sure that in elemental forces there is purification, and I want to go back to them and live in their presence, of course to one so modern as I am, enfant de mon siècle, siècle rather. I'm an infant of the sickle moon, or the crescent moon thereof. Merely to look at the world will always be lovely. I tremble with pleasure when I think that on the very day of my leaving prison, both the laburnum and the lilac will be blooming in the gardens, and then I shall see the wind stir into restless beauty, the swaying gold of the one, and make the other toss the pale purple of its plumes, so that all the air shall be Arabia for me. Linnaeus fell on his knees and wept for joy when he saw for the first time the long heath of some English upland made yellow with the tawny aromatic brooms of the common firs. And I know that for me, 
to whom flowers are part of desire, there are tears waiting in the petals of some rose. It has always been so with me from my boyhood. There is not a single color hidden away in the chalice of a flower or the curve of a shell to which by some subtle sympathy with the very soul of things my nature does not answer. Like Gautier, I have always been one of those pour qui le monde visible existe. A which the visible world exists. Still, I'm conscious now that behind all this beauty, satisfying though it may be, there's some spirit hidden of which the painted forms and shapes are but modes of manifestation, and is with this spirit that I desire to become in harmony. I've grown tired of the articulate utterances of men and things. The mystical in art, the mystical in life, the mystical in nature, this is what I'm looking for. It is absolutely necessary for me to find it somewhere. All trials are trials for one's life. Just as all sentences are sentences of death, and three times I have been tried. The first time I left the box to be arrested, the second time to be led back to the house of detention, the third time to pass into a prison for two years. Society, as we have constituted it, will have no place for me, has none to offer, but nature whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike will have clefts in the rock where I may hide in secret valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. She will hang the night with stars so that I may walk abroad in the darkness without stumbling and send the wind over my footprints so that none may track me to my hurt. She will cleanse me in great waters and with bitter herbs make me whole.